Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for staying for my session. Um, I, uh, I believe that any space on Earth can be transformed by poetry. All you need, essentially, is uh, a little bit of time, maybe some magic, a few science fiction effects, and you can turn it into a poem. Now, when I was putting this speech together, I started to watch a few episodes of Doctor Who, and because I talk quite a bit about poetry and so I don't bore myself, I'm going to weave some Doctor Who themes into this talk. So I'll be a poet on the stage, but I think I'll also be a time lord at the same time. So Doctor Who had a TARDIS, time and its relative dimensions in space, and he used that TARDIS to travel and explore all over the universe, all the secret pockets um, that exist in, in the various worlds. Um, <clears throat> poems do exactly that as well. Now, the reason that Doctor Who used his TARDIS to explore the world was so that he could understand more about himself and the universe in which he lived, which is the same thing that poems do. Now, I don't, uh, unlike Doctor Who, I didn't steal my TARDIS, but I do have a TARDIS and I made it myself. And this TARDIS is what I call the Red Room Company. So I don't actually make science fiction noises, I make poems. And with a compassionate, loyal and adventurous team, we travel around Australia and take poems and poets into different spaces in order to transform that particular space. Now, um, the very first space that I'd like you to sort of imagine or think about is a truck. And you can see one here on the screen. But you all have your own independent truck in your mind. And I was standing at a Bowser in Canberra one day, a petrol Bowser, thinking, wouldn't it be really interesting if you could tell the story of Australian truck drivers through poetry? And then I was looking at a truck thinking, it's interesting that on the outside a truck is, is, um, is one size, but once you go inside, a truck would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the idea as well, I like that, um, that poetry itself is a vehicle for travelling in through different spaces, and a truck would do that as well. And I thought, truck drivers are alone in their truck day after day. They get up, they think about life, they think about death, they leave their family, they go on the road, they see things and travel through landscapes, and this is what poets and poems do as well. So I decided to create a project called Dust Poems, which worked with Australian truck drivers. So not knowing any truck drivers, and obviously not being a truck driver myself, I decided to cold call a whole lot of trucking companies and fleets. So essentially picked up the phone and said, oh, hello, is there anybody in your trucking company that writes poems? Um, <laughs> and, and the very first person who answered the phone was a truck driver who wrote poems. And not only was he a truck driver who wrote poems, he had a daughter who also wrote poems. Um, this, I'll talk about this in a minute. So um, <clears throat> we had a few truck drivers, and the idea was to get about 10. And what we were going to do with those poems was we were going to turn them into posters, which you can see here, and place them around Sydney Olympic Park. And we also had this idea to make a little log, uh, a log book of the truck, the truckies' poetry, so about five. Um, then I thought, well, let's see if we can get a truck drivers from all over Australia. So. Then I started thinking about, oh, who is a truck driver who was driven trucks and, you know, who could probably try and connect us with truck drivers and has a reasonably good voice and I've heard him sing and, of course, it was John Laws. So <clears throat> approached John Laws, um, rang him up and said, would you do a call out to your listeners for truck driving poets? And he did and then we had the truckies. And we ended up having about 30, um, 30 truck drivers who wrote poems that we turned into a logbook. And so it was this idea of poetry, trying to find poets in different spaces or places that you wouldn't normally expect poets to be found in. This is one of our truck driver poets. Well, actually, this is two. This is Mick O'Brien, and this is his wife. Both of them, uh, both of them drive trucks. So I travelled to Melbourne in one of the trucks with him. He read a whole series of poems. A lot of the poems that truck drivers write actually are on their mobile phones that they have in their truck. And then he came to perform at Sydney Olympic Park, his truck poems. Um, you can see here, this is one one of the maps that we use to make our little log books. The Red Room Company makes all sorts of um, little objects to do with poetry. That's some of the landscape that was 
that was along the way. So the other thing, as I was thinking about this talk, that is a similarity between Doctor Who and the TARDIS and time, is, is time travel, and that's something that poems do really well. So poems, for those of you who write poetry or know about poetry, it has its own particular time that you go into when you write a poem, and it's normally a slow and contemplative time. Um, and the other thing that I love about poetry, and I suppose this is a little bit like Doctor Who as well, is that people often stumble across poems. So you can't really force a poem down someone's throat. Often they fall into your lap as if by magic. And so it happened that I was over at my grandparents' house in England, sitting by the window talking to the pigeons. Um, my grandparents had two pigeons that came and visited them every day for 10 years, and then one pigeon died, and then my grandfather died. Then the other pigeon died, and my grandmother died. It's a true story. But I was sitting at the window thinking, oh, it'd be really interesting if you could somehow work with pigeons and poetry, because so many poets write about flight, and humans are obsessed with flight, either always wanting to fly, and I read an article that was saying it's something to do with that we should have had wings come out of our back, and so essentially we're all interested in flight because we actually have bones that make us want to fly, but it's another talk. Um, and then at the same time, I was reading the newspaper and look, looking at all of these articles about cricket and Australia, and why is it that Australians are so obsessed with betting and with cricket and not so much with poetry? So I came upon this idea. <laughs> Um, to devise a project that was called Pigeon Poetry. And what we did is we teamed up with pigeon fanciers uh, in the south coast of New South Wales, two of them that you can see here. And then what we decided to do was to create a pigeon race. So how could you get Australians to bet, essentially, on poems, but also on pigeons, and a project that involved flight as well? And so we created tiny... Uh, we commissioned 10 Australian poets to write poems, and the Red Room Company commissions Australian poets as one of the main things that we do. Each of the poets wrote a poem that we then attached to a little scroll that was then wrapped around the ankle of the pigeon. And then we decided to set up an online betting system where you couldn't actually bet on... Uh, sorry, where you could bet on what pigeon was going to win. You could also bet on what you thought the best poem was. You could bet on uh, anything you like because, essentially, um, the pigeon, although they've got an inbuilt homing device, would, would land in one... one um, their, their home spot, but depending on the weather and other things, such as a falcon, for example, that might happen along the way, you can't actually be sure. And I really like this as well, this link to uh, poetry too, that you can't ever be sure what the poem's going to be. So you start to write it, but really anything can happen during the writing process, and then, you know, the poem becomes itself. And I also really like the other link between poetry and pigeons too, or poetry and flight, which is that once you've written a poem, it disappears, you sort of publish it or you, you get it out of your system and then it flows into the world for anybody um, to do what they want to with it. The other thing about this particular project that we did um, is we thought it would be quite interesting to um, somehow use technology in this particular project. Um, I don't think that's the pigeon there, but uh, we decided to see if we could get, get a sort of a, a bird's eye view of the project. And I had also thought the Red Room Company being not for profit, we could maybe use this particular bird's eye view and I'll maybe sell it to New South Wales Tourism or something like that. And this will make sense when I tell you what we did, which is we worked very closely with the pigeon fanciers to train one particular bird that could carry a tiny little camera that was attached to its back. Um, and the idea was that we'd set the, the pigeon, the race off, and this particular pigeon would carry um, the camera all the way down the south coast, and we collected at the end with the footage. So the race began, and we had 100 or so people. It was down near Stanwell Tops. Um, all of the p pigeons flew off, and every single pigeon got back home, um, except for the one with the camera. So... <clears throat> We don't actually know what happened. And for those of you, you've probably heard a bit about pigeons. Um, you know, there could be falcons that ha have maybe got the pigeon on the way. Alternatively, the pigeon could have just decided that it didn't want to go home and it flew somewhere else entirely. And for about a year after this particular pigeon event, we had people writing to us all the time, sending us pictures of pigeons that they thought might have been the one <laughs> that they found in their backyard carrying the camera. So, you know, it continues to have this uh, pigeon um, feel throughout all of the Red Room projects. And again, I sort of like to talk about pigeons today because obviously they're alien creatures with their own language, which is very much like, I suppose, what Doctor Who does when he travels into these spaces and finds um, these aliens in order to communicate with. The other thing that I was thinking about 
in terms of uh, poetry and Doctor Who. Oh, that, by the way, is the winner of the pigeon race, Ivy Island, um, with her little pigeon that was made out of cardboard. Um, but one of the things that the, uh, the Red Room Company does, and I think poetry does very well, is it is a point of connection. It connects people, obviously to themselves, but to other things around them. And again, this is what the TARDIS does. Um, and one of the most important things I think that, the, that poems do in terms of their connecting as well is they connect you to, to a particular energy that you get when you write or when you read poetry. And to an extent, I think you could argue that about all sorts of art forms. You heard foreplay before. When you hear that sort of music, it provides you with some zest that you can't actually explain what it was, but it, it makes you feel and do something, gives you this, this vibrancy that you didn't have before. And so we wanted to create a project that would, um, I suppose, allow as many people as possible to come into contact with poetry, to connect all of these disparate communities together through the poem. And so we came up with this idea of a project called Clubs and Societies. What that is, excuse that photo, my skirt's a bit short there. I noticed that when I was putting it on the slides. Um, um, <clears throat> oh, without wanting to put it on, but it was too late. Um, so we decided to commission um, uh, about 20 or 30 Australian poets to write a poem, but also to spend time with a variety of clubs and societies throughout Australia. The idea is that the poet goes into that particular clubs and society, so essentially gets out of the poet world of the TARDIS and enters into another TARDIS of sorts, which is a club and society. They spend time going to the club meetings, getting to know the vernacular of the clubs, the secret codes, the things that the clubs do, and then the poets write a poem with that club and also for themselves as a gift to the club. So some of the clubs and societies that we're working with range from um, a UFO sighting club. Um, we have a club in Melbourne called the Jerky Club, which is a club that makes only food uh, out of jerky. So beef jerky, but all sorts of bubblegum jerky, chocolate jerky, all these sorts of things. So the poet will spend time with them getting to know the club. We're working with the Wayside Chapel, for those of you who know the Wayside Chapel, an outreach centre based in King's Cross, and they've created a club specifically for, the, for this particular project. So a poet goes into Wayside Chapel, spends time with the club and writes the poems and shares skills. And that's something that's really important for all of the Red Rooms projects is a skill sharing. Not dissimilar in a way to Doctor Who. You know, he has his assistants or goes into spaces, into different spaces and places and he'll share his skills with them but at the same time learn from them as well. This particular picture that you can see here is the role, Illa, uh, from the Illawarra uh, Roller Derby Club. For those of you who know about roller derby, girls that go around on roller skates in a, in a circle chasing each other and nudging each other out of the way really violently but really excitedly. Um, and this particular event that we went to, one of the, the teams was a fox team or something like that. And Candy is the poet there who wrote a poem for them about violence, which she said she read to them after the show and she read the poem about violence and then they all burst into tears. So it's this idea of poetry connecting people to each other. And the other thing as well I think that's really important about the notion of clubs and societies for this particular project is that people can also feel like they belong to something for a particular time. And I think the, everyone's need to belong is really interesting and certainly I think why um, people write poetry in that it allows them to belong to themselves to an extent. Um, one of the other clubs that I think is also really interesting to talk about is Oolong House. This is um, a rehab centre for Indigenous and non-Indigenous men on the south coast. And this is a club that was again created by the people who are at Oolong House for the project. They team up with us and also with Bundan on Trust, which is a big area that was uh, a homescape of Arthur Boy that was gifted to the community um, in order for the community to use whenever they want. So this particular club that the Oolong House people are making um, is that they will go for nighttime excursions to Bundan on Trust, where essentially we'll be writing poems about the stars. And it gets them out of this sort of halfway house, essentially, and through poetry takes them to another landscape where they can write their poems. And this is an image from one of the other clubs, which is um, uh, the New South Wales Astronomical Society, who um, will be writing poems for the projects too. One of the things that... Um, perhaps is most important to me about poetry, and again, I think is one of probably the best links to Doctor Who, is that poetry and the poet 
uh, and Doctor Who essentially all get to be reborn and they get to change with time. So unlike me and this talk, I will run out of time, but Doctor Who and the poems don't actually ever run out of time. So with each new reading, an individual um, re gives that poem a new sense of time. You could read a poem when you're 20 and because of the passage of time, it'll change by the time you're 50. You'll go back to the poem and you'll read it in a brand new way. And so this constant evolution, I think, is why people love poetry and why poetry has lasted. And the other thing that I also love about poetry and about Doctor Who is the notion of surprises and twists. You know, at the end of every single Doctor Who episode, there's a strange twist. And so for the end of my talk, I'd just like to put a little twist in there, which is that for some of you special beings, if you look very closely under your seat, you might find a little poem for you. And therefore, this whole space will have been transformed by poetry. Thank you very much. Thank you.